Robert Gruler here. I'm a criminal defense attorney. Today we're talking about the Kyle Rittenhouse case even further because there's more developments. Today the criminal complaint was just filed with the court. We're going to dive through it. One of the most interesting complaints that I've seen recently, and we're going to tell you why. I think it's it's written in a way that you can drive a legal truck through, and we're going to talk about that. What does that mean exactly? We're going to dive into it. So first and foremost, let's take a look at the actual header of the complaint. So when we're talking about the actual complaint itself, we can see here this is what it looks like. State of Wisconsin versus Kyle H. Rittenhouse filed on August 27, 2020 with the clerk of the circuit court in Kenosha County, Wisconsin. And it's going to be heard by the Honorable Bruce Schroeder. And so we want to talk a little bit about who that is, because a judge is very important in a case like this. A judge is going to be the person who is going to be ruling on the motions, right? So if you uh, submit a motion to suppress evidence, for example, the judge is going to rule on that. Both sides are going to make their arguments, and then the judge is ultimately going to be, uh, make the final decision on that. And so the judge can be instrumental in uh, plea negotiations. They can handle settlement conferences. And so it's really important that we know who this person is. And we do now that the case has been filed and assigned. The gentleman who is going to be hearing the case is Judge Bruce Schroeder. And a little bit of information about Bruce Schroeder. Bruce Schroeder earned his undergraduate degree from Marquette University in 1967. 1970, he earned his JD from the same school. He was appointed to the bench by Governor Tony Earle, who is a Democrat, and that some that uh, happened in 1983. So you can you know ask yourself whether or not that actually matters. Uh, the Democrats today, I'm sure, are very different than the Democrats in 1983, and so I don't really think you can read anything into that. What I do think is important is that it does sound like this judge was actually a former prosecutor. We see here that from 1971 to 1972, he was the assistant district attorney. From 1972 to on to 1977, he was the actual district attorney. And then he went into private practice before becoming a judge. And this is the same sort of a formula that we see for a lot of prosecutors. They start off as prosecutors. They use that as sort of uh, their their calling card to then become a defense attorney. They used to, they always shout, yeah, I used to be a prosecutor, therefore I'm uh, amazing somehow. And they become a defense attorney. Uh, I call them the the non true bloods. There are those of us who are true blood defense attorneys, but some of these prosecutors are not. You know, they kind of flip sides a little bit. So I like to needle them from time to time. But this judge, he he kind of did that, right? He was a prosecutor. Sounds like he went to the defense. I don't know that for sure because he stopped practicing in 1983. Then he became a judge and he's been sitting on the bench ever since then. But what does that mean? Do we actually know anything about this judge? Not really. Obviously, I'm not licensed in Wisconsin. I don't know him personally, but I was able to find a, an article from the AP that was written in 2006 that is entitled Hundreds Ask to Avoid Court of the Kenosha Judge. The reputation of one Kenosha County Circuit judge is apparently so daunting that hundreds of defendants request a different judge, creating imbalances in the workloads of different felony courts. And, of course, judge doesn't know why. He doesn't know why as many as 250 people since August have requested that somebody else hear their cases. And, you know, this is something that happens in Arizona happens all over the country in basically any place that has the ability to file what's called a notice for a change of judge. If you're a criminal defendant, you have a right to just strike that judge. You ask for a different judge. It sort of helps eliminate bias or perceptions of bias just to say you just have a strike. You just get to we're not going to even ask any questions. Just file this notice and we'll change judge. So really, that's what's what was happening with Judge Bruce Schroeder for uh, for you know for some time. They there was some speculation in the article you know why why did this happen it says here that schroeder is known for his occasional fiery style sharp tongue and stiff sentences he can also be unpredictable says defense attorney michael uh, Ciccinelli. from a defense standpoint clients like somewhat more certainty and another judge actually said i think judge schroeder is sometimes stern in his sentences but he goes on to say the sentences are no longer on average no worse than any other judge. So that's what we know. You know, nothing nothing really groundbreaking there, but it does help provide some context. You know, this, this judge may be somebody who is, you know, a little harsher on sentences than otherwise because it sounds like defense attorneys have probably caught wind 
of what it's like to be a defense attorney in his courtroom. And they've been recommending to their clients, you got to change this judge, file a notice for a change of judge. Now that happened in 2006. It's ancient, you know, ancient history, especially in today's world. So we don't know, you know, if that has changed or if this is still something that is going on, but it, it does provide some historical context. All right, so now let's dive into the complaint. So I was explaining this is the main uh, headline of the complaint. So this is the the, the header, uh, the case caption. So you can see all of the information here. We're just going to go right into it now. So what I've done is I've broken up the complaint. I've actually clipped it out from the original PDF file. And then I've added some information, underlined some things so that we can really start sort of breaking this thing down and understanding how is this going to process as it goes through the court. So the first charge that we're going to see is the first degree reckless homicide charge with the use of a dangerous weapon. And this goes over to uh, this individual right here, Joseph Rosenbaum. So if you remember him, uh, this was from this part of the interaction where Kyle Rittenhouse is actually being chased down by Joseph Rosenbaum. So this is him right here. This photograph comes from a different uh, picture of the evening where he was you know, basically getting in somebody else's face and saying, you know, why don't you shoot me? You want to shoot somebody, shoot me type of language. Uh, that was earlier in the evening. And then, you know, essentially he was being provocative it, from what we were able to see. This is a mugshot that I was able to find from him. Don't have any other, you know, sort of flattering pictures that I was able to come across. Otherwise I would have included one just for the sake of balance. But we have a mugshot and then we have a picture from him earlier in the night and then we see him here sort of being chased away. So they're saying that Kyle actually did recklessly cause the death of him under the circumstances showing an utter disregard for human life contrary to the statutes. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the statutes today on this show. I spent a long time uh, yesterday or in the previous video really detailing the statutes. Spent about 45 minutes going through every single one of them. So we're not going to do that again. I'm going to presume that you watch that video. You're up to speed on that. And so we're just going to read the complaint and the probable cause statement because like I said this is something that is written in my opinion so kind of one-sided that there's only really one log logical conclusion that we can come to and we will get there so that was count one count one goes uh, you know it's basically the victim of that count is Joseph Rosenbaum which is this uh, this individual right here all right so we have him uh, here count number two complaint number two is going to involve the chief video director for the Daily Caller this is Richard McGinnis this is his photograph right here from his Twitter account if you want to follow him uh, I actually have his Twitter handle later in uh, the presentation here today and so you can follow him if you'd like but he is the, the victim of of a first degree recklessly endangering the safety, you know, his safety. And we're going to dive into why they included him on this complaint. You know, why is he the victim of a crime? He wasn't actually shot or anything. If you remember, this is him. When Rosenbaum was shot, McGinnis actually goes over there and takes his shirt off and he's trying to heal, uh, you know, or, or, to, or you know, to kind of nurture or save him, uh, help him with his wounds. And why is my, there we go. He's trying to help him with the, with the bullet wounds. Now we're going to learn later that he was shot multiple times and sort of the efforts of McGinnis don't really do much of anything. He shot multiple times. So he was going to die, but he is the stated victim of this crime. And so it's important to recognize that because we're going to hear a lot of statements from him. He really is the only witness in this entire case. We're going to see the, the, the other witnesses that they talk to. There really isn't anybody else. This guy is the only sort of independent witness. The other people, the, the, the three of them were shot. Two of them died. One of them had a had a bullet wound in his uh, his elbow. We're going to get to all of them, but they are not actual witnesses to what happened, at least in the first part of the incident. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about McGinnis's statements. And the third complaint, the third count of the criminal charge is going to be because of the death of Anthony Huber. Now, Anthony Huber is here. We can see this. This is his his photograph right here. It was also the same guy we see here. So he was approaching Kyle Rittenhouse and was hitting him actually with the skateboard because he was shot in this altercation and he died. They're charging Kyle with first degree intentional homicide, use of a dangerous weapon because he did cause the death and he did intend to kill that person against these two violations. So that's going to be count three. We move on to count four 
and this is going to be the other uh, individual who was shot in the shoulder and or in the elbow, and his name is Gage Grosskretz. And this is uh, who he is. Let me get rid of myself there. We've got Gage Grosskretz, who was this individual here, who, uh, no, here, over here, he's running up to Kyle as he's on the ground. We're going to see when we when we continue forward that Kyle actually sort of sits up and, and fires around. It hits him in his right elbow. You can see him right here. Now, you can see in, in both of these photographs, he's got a gun right there. He's got a handgun physically on him. And then here, when he's nurturing his wound, I covered it with a blue uh, circle here because it's really, really graphic. It's really gruesome, actually. And uh, YouTube gave us an age restriction on one of our other videos for uh, showing stuff like that. So I learned my lesson, not going to do that anymore. But he has a handgun here as well. He's also got a criminal record. That doesn't really matter here. But this is the, the fourth, uh, you know, it's attempted first degree intentional homicide. So that's what they are doing on that one. The, the, uh, Fifth count is going to be against an unknown person. So we don't even know who this individual is, but you can see him here from the video footage. He's literally jump kicking Kyle Rittenhouse right essentially in the head. And they're going to charge Kyle with attempting to uh, basically you know, fire at him, which is a reckless endangerment. It's, it's endangering his safety. And so you can see that this unknown individual, we don't know who that is, is going to be the victim in count five. We move on and we've got count six, which is going to be the possession of a dangerous weapon by a person under 18. This one really is sort of the most you know, uninteresting to analyze. My understanding is I haven't taken a deep dive into the statutes, but that it's technically illegal for somebody who's under the age of 18 to openly carry a, a firearm. However, I have read that there are some exceptions to that rule if it is a rifle or sort of a long barreled uh, a firearm that doesn't have any modifications to it. So, you know, if that's the case, there may be an exclusion to this. This is the least interesting charge in, in, in my mind, at least in terms of criminal liability. If he's convicted of this thing, okay, you know, what does he do? He goes, he goes to prison for nine months. I really don't think that's going to happen. But if, if it did, that's a lot you know, uh, better of an outcome for Kyle than uh, life in prison for uh, several different murders, which is where it looks like they're trying to go. Now, there are some other interesting things about that particular charge, because if there, there are some arguments to be made based on the video that I did previously, when we analyze the statutes, there, there are some sort of some pressure relief valves that if a person is being charged with a crime and they want to exercise the self-defense privilege, they can't do that if they were breaking the law. In other words, you can't break the law and then suddenly claim self-defense when somebody responds to you breaking the law. I don't think that that really is is what happened here, but that is going to be uh, something something that the prosecutor's office may may be able to break up. I don't think that they're going to just based on the rest of the complaint. As we as we get there, you're going to see what I mean. All right, so let's dive into it. So the way that Wisconsin handles their criminal complaints is it looks like I'm not, this is the first one I've ever read, but it looks like what they're doing is they're establishing the counts and then they're including the probable cause statement right in the same document. I don't know if that's normal. I don't know in Arizona, we don't do it that way. We have separate documents for that and there are separate proceedings for that, but th this may be just, they may have included it on that so that the public could see it because this is such a high profile case. They're just saying, look, we're going to include the probable cause statement with the filing so that everybody can see see it. This is where it starts. So let's dive into the meat and potatoes of the probable cause statement. So here, like I said, this is all clipped directly from the PDF. I just clipped it and threw it on a slide so that we can make sense of it and sort of break it down piece by piece. I'm going to read it and then we'll do some quick analysis on it. All right. So the probable cause statement starts with, it says your complainant spoke with these sergeants at the Kenosha Police Department who provided the following information. August 25th, we know curfew was imposed around 8 p.m. and they were located east of the I-94 Kenosha County due to civil unrest. We all got that. August 25th, 1145 shooting occurred. Here's what they're doing. They're, 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 they really need to establish location. So they need to explain where the shooting happened. In a previous video, I explained that it was right, right here. You can see here in the map, this is the corner of 63rd and Sheridan where there is a car uh, repair center. They're, they're explaining where this happened. The reason why this is important is they have to establish jurisdiction. They, they have to establish, establish some legal elements and jurisdiction is one of them. 
So they are doing that. They're establishing that. They said that the man who was shot at this location was identified as Joseph Rosenbaum, transported to the local hospital and died. Now, the curfew portion of this, everybody was violating it, right? So they didn't even charge him with that, with a curfew violation, because everybody was violating it. The cops knew it. I played it on a video previously. We saw that the cops actually even offered Kyle and some of the other people who were with him uh, water bottles. You know, they, they knew they were there. They knew they were in violation of curfew, but nobody was enforcing it. So I really don't think that that is a big deal or that that opens the can. In other words, if he was, they, they're not going to claim that he was breaking the law and therefore that invalidates his self-defense or any of those other doctrines. I don't see that happening, but, uh, but technically they could because he was in violation of the law or they could at least try. Now, as a quick refresher, this is where the, both of the sort of groupings of the shootings took place. Really, in my opinion, I think this was one entire situation, one kind of continuous uh, ordeal. The first shots happened here. We remember that Kyle was sort of running across. Uh, the shots happened here. He circled back around, pop, popped out under the vehicle, and then he started running away this way. He gets chased. He gets knocked down. The shootings take place right about here, and then he runs up further towards the uh, gas station convenience center up here, and that's when he, the cops kind of pass him by. And so you know, it, it all happened pretty quickly from the videos. It was a little bit hard to tell. We couldn't tell if it was really two separate incidents or not, but it all was looped together pretty quickly. So we had this part of the complaint. It goes on and it says that in the course of investigating this incident, law enforcement reviewed the multiple videos, basically the same videos that we saw. They uh, identified Kyle Rittenhouse. This is a very uninteresting portion of the, the complaint because all they're doing is they're just establishing a couple things. One, they're identifying Kyle Rittenhouse. Two, they're identifying the, the location, the car source parking lot. They're explaining where Kyle's from. They're saying that they identified the gun, Smith & Wesson AR-15 style 223, and it holds 30 rounds. And, and they're basically you know listing out the parties, but there's not a whole lot to take away from this. Not particularly interesting. The next paragraph is a little bit, right? So this is where we start to see that the, the probable cause statement, and, and to back up a little bit, the probable cause statement is written by the prosecutor's office, right? Why do they do this? Is this the police report? Is this the, the, you know, the full police file? It's not. It's just a probable cause statement. So let's think about this. If you're charged with a crime, they need to have a reason to charge you with the crime. They can't just say, well, I don't like that person, so we're going to charge him with treason. Right. That's what they did back in you know, the Middle Ages. A king would just say, yeah, I don't like that person, so we're going to charge him with a million crimes. There's no basis for it, but because somebody had that power, they did that, and they were able to sort of use that as an excuse to you know, eliminate their enemies. Well, in America, we have to have a basis for filing criminal charges against somebody due to the wisdom of our founders and the wisdom of our, our you know, justice system. And what they're doing here is they're establishing the basis for the charges. They need to explain why it's even probable that this actually happened. They need to establish some sort of facts in order to take the case forward. So that's all this is. There's going to be a lot more information that comes out. And I'm going to explain what that is in, 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 towards the end of this uh, program here. But for our purposes, just just kind of know that this is there's a lot of information here and a lot to dissect. But this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, and this is just just enough to get them to the next stage. All right, so enough of that. So let's go back to it. It says the video shows that as they cross the parking lot, Rosenbaum now appears to throw an object at the defendant. The object does not hit the defendant, and a second video shows, based on where the object landed, that it was a plastic bag. Rosenbaum appears to be unarmed for the duration of the video. A review of the second video shows that the defendant and Rosenbaum continue to move across the parking lot and approach the front of the black car parked in the lot. A loud bang is heard on the video, then a male shouts, F you. Then Rosenbaum appears to continue to approach, and the defendant gets in near proximity to the, to the defendant, and when four more loud bangs are heard, Rosenbaum then falls to the ground. So I read that a little wrong. Rosenbaum appears to continue to approach the defendant and gets in near proximity to the defendant before four more loud bangs are heard. All right, so here is Rosenbaum, right? And this is a photograph that I found somewhere, one of the news articles or, or on Twitter or something. And this looks like Rosenbaum, right? This is the same guy that we saw in previous photos. He has a red shirt. As he's running through this area, you can't really see here. You are seeing him in a red shirt. It looks like him. 
That is a bag he's holding earlier in the night. That is the bag that is on the ground. And so, you know, this part, this part is interesting because they, they say that it was a plastic bag in the probable cause statement, but I would be curious is, you know, is it, did anybody pick that up and look in there and what, you know, what was in there and why is he carrying this thing? You know, if you look at that closely, it looks like there's some weight to that bag. It looks like it's heavy. Uh, I can't imagine that this guy, you know, brought, brought his lunch over to, uh, to, to, a, to a, you know, a riot or a, a protest, whatever he thought he was joining. And it looked to me like, you know, he threw it and it landed on the ground and it had some oomph to it. You know, it actually, it actually kind of moved or, or stuck on the ground. Like a, to me, it looked like what they were trying to do was, why is that doing that? They were, they were trying to, you know, uh, actually use it as a weapon, almost like you would, you would sort of, you know, sort of swing it around and throw it. I forget what that weapon's called, but that's what it looked like to me. And there's also some interesting language here because it also says that, you know, he's basically the aggressor here. Rosenbaum appears to continue to approach the defendant. He's approaching Kyle. He gets in near proximity to the defendant. He's throwing something at the defendant. All of this stuff is happening against Kyle, you know, to Kyle, it's happening to him. It's not the other way around. So just from this language, now this is not my language. Okay. I did not write that. This is from the prosecutor's office who is prosecuting Kyle Rittenhouse. They are explaining in this that this other guy was the one who appeared to continue to approach him. He gets in near proximity. He appears to throw an object. So why are they putting that in this in this criminal complaint, if it's making it sound like Rosenbaum was the problem here, not Kyle. We're going to see a lot of that as we continue to move forward. So let's go back and we're going to see the next paragraph. It says that the, de the defendant then circles behind the car and approaches Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum remains on the ground. McGinnis also approaches. McGinnis, we're going to get to here briefly. McGinnis, if you don't remember, was the other, he's actually this guy who took his shirt off. He's the one who I, I spoke about in one of the earlier counts. This was the video editor for the Daily Caller. I think he previously used to work for the Mark Levin show. And, you know, he's out there just capturing footage. Once he sees this shot go down, he takes his shirt off and he runs over there. McGinnis also approaches, removes his shirt, and attempt to, attempts to render aid to Rosenbaum. The defendant appears to get on his cell phone which he is right there. He's holding the phone to his head and place a call. Another male approaches. The defendant turns and begins to run away. As the defendant is running away, he can be heard on the phone saying, I just killed somebody. So, so uh, we've, we've got McGinnis here. We've got Rosenbaum, who is now on the ground. And then we've got Kyle, who actually you know calls for help and then turns around. So the next paragraph is where we start to see what we learn from the interview from McGinnis. So Detective uh, C. Press interviews McGinnis, and he indicates the following. And he says, before the shooting, McGinnis was interviewing the defendant. This is kind of nonsense, but it, it it's, it's interesting. The defendant told McGinnis that he was a trained medic. McGinnis stated that he, McGinnis, has handled many ARs and that the defendant was not handling his weapon very well. McGinnis said that, as they were walking south, another armed male who appeared to be in his 30s joined them and said that they were there to protect the defendant. McGinnis stated that before the defendant reached the parking lot and ran across it, the defendant had moved from the middle of Sheridan Road to the sidewalk and that that is when McGinnis saw a male, Rosenbaum, which is this fellow, when he saw Rosenbaum initially try to engage the defendant. So McGinnis saw a male, Rosenbaum, initially try to engage the defendant. Which, which mirrors the previous paragraph that says that Rosenbaum was essentially kind of going after him. McGinnis stated that as the defendant was walking, Rosenbaum was trying to get closer to the defendant, was trying to get closer to the defendant. When Rosenbaum advanced, the defendant did a juke move and started running. McGinnis stated that there were other people that were moving very quickly. He said that they were moving towards the defendant. He said that according to what he saw, the defendant was trying to evade the individuals. So again, we're seeing language from the prosecutor that makes it look like Kyle Rittenhouse is somebody who was trying to get away from this whole situation. He said that McGin McGinnis says that he saw Rosenbaum initially try to engage the defendant. He said that Rosenbaum was trying to get closer to the defendant. The defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse, made a juke move, right? And in juke, you remember in football, you try to juke somebody out of their shorts and you try to get away from them. That's what a juke is. And then he started running. Others were moving towards the defendant and the defendant was trying to evade those individuals. So not aggressive. He was fleeing. He was retreating. He was being pursued by a number of other people. 
And why, why is he being charged with a crime again for this one? All right, well, let's, let's move on. So McGinnis described the point where the defendant had reached the car. McGinnis described that the defendant had the gun in a low ready position, meaning that he had the gun raised but pointed downward. The butt of the gun would have been uh, at an angle downwards from the shoulder. McGinnis stated that the defendant brought the gun up and that he stepped back, and he thinks the defendant fired three rounds in rapid succession. McGinnis said that when the first round went off, he thought it hit the pavement. McGinnis felt something on his leg. He first thought he was shot. He was wondering if he gotten shot. He, he, McGinnis was behind and then slightly to the right of Rosenbaum in the line of fire. And uh, that's where he was when the defendant shot. So when you watch the video, this is a screen grab that I took. It's super blurry, but you can see it in motion. This is Rittenhouse. Remember, they run this way wrote in, and they kind of go back behind this, this black car here. Rittenhouse fires his weapon. Rosenbaum is hit. Rosenbaum falls, and McGinnis is right here. So he he is right. He's he's directly in the line of fire. It looks like. I mean, a couple shots here. He's sort of in between these two vehicles. So presumably, you know, he is in the line of fire when the defendant shot. Now I think that is 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 accurate, right? I mean, he he was there, which is why they're charging him with first degree recklessly endangering uh, another safety with the use of a dangerous weapon. And, you know, is that something that's that's going to stick? We reviewed the statutes yesterday and what we had talked about was the use of self-defense and what happens if that that use of that force spills over into, you know, and, and, and injures somebody else. Based on the video that I did, I think there's pretty good protections in place to say that some of that third party liability, as long as it doesn't result in death. So if McGinnis would have been shot and killed, he would, you know, Kyle wouldn't have been excused for that, but because he wasn't, he wasn't actually shot. He wasn't injured at all. He was just in the general vicinity. Was any real harm done to him other than maybe some trauma you know, of seeing somebody die in front of him and try to save their lives? So obviously, that's a traumatic thing. I'm not saying that that you know what what McGinnis went through. I, I don't want to downplay the, this incident at all. It was a very serious thing. But you know, was he shot? No. Was he killed? No. Was he injured? No. You know, so. There is some some provisions in the Wisconsin statutes that we covered previously that I think would relieve him. You know, I'm speaking about Kyle would relieve Kyle Rittenhouse of the criminal liability if the self-defense doctrine is appropriate. In other words, if he can claim self-defense, it's going to also apply to his you know, sort of in, in, including McGinnis in his circle. If he can say self-defense was appropriate, then the fact that he, you know, he he could have almost shot McGinnis isn't going to be a big deal. It's not even going to be, you know, it's going to it's going to be covered within the self-defense doctrine. So we'll see where that goes. But I don't think that that count too is even particularly strong on that. I mean, he was in the line of sight, but I think the self-defense doctrine is going to supersede that charge. And there were a couple interesting things to note on this one. Uh, McGinnis, he said he heard three rounds. If you remember. When we did the previous video about uh, analyzing the audio in conjunction to the video, we did see that there was sort of a, a burst of four shots and then a burst of three shots. So we heard, you know, sort of pop, 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 pop. Yep. And then we heard three more pops. And the first four were the ones that were, you know, Rosenbaum went down. And then the other three, we really don't know. Uh, what was going on with those just yet. There's been some, you know, I've, I've had some comments on this channel that some people are saying that that was a different weapon, very well could have been. We remember that when we, when we see Kyle at the very end of this ordeal, get up and start walking to the police, it sounds like there's a lot of other gunfire going on in the background. So there, we know that there were other people shooting. We know that the first shot from what we can tell was from a handgun that was in the first part of that video. We saw that, we covered that in the previous video. But the point is, is there was a lot of bullets going off and really nobody, nobody knew what was, what was happening with that. So we're gonna see what happens with that count two. We go back over to count one. This is the first degree reckless use of a dangerous weapon homicide, right? So this, the, the, the complaint goes on. It says McGinnis stated that the first round went into the ground. And when the second shot went off, the defendant actually had the gun aimed at Rosenbaum. So he, he had it down and then he fired one into the ground and then put it up towards Rosenbaum. McGinnis stated he did not hear the two exchange any words. McGinnis said that the unarmed guy Rosenbaum was trying to get the defendant's gun again another aggressive maneuver from Rosenbaum that is backed up by McGinnis. He's, he's saying that the other guy was, a, was the aggressor and trying to take his gun. And this is just connecting the dots. He was approaching him as he was running. He threw a bag at him. And then as, it, as the altercation proceeded, 
Rosenbaum did not back off. Rosenbaum kept moving forward and actually even tried to take his gun. McGinnis demonstrated by extending both of his hands in a quick grabbing motion. So he kind of, you know, said he was going like this and pulled the gun towards him. And he, he tried to reach for the defendant's gun. Detective indicates that he asked McGinnis if Rosenbaum had his hands on the gun when the defendant shot. McGinnis said that he definitely made a motion. That he was trying to grab the barrel of the gun. McGinnis stated that the defendant pulled it away and then raised it. So Kyle pulled it away and raised it. McGinnis stated that right as they came together, so, so right as they, you know, they came, boom, and connected, then the defendant fired. McGinnis said that when Rosenbaum was shot, he leaned forward towards the defendant. And then he stated that after the defendant shot, he ran backwards towards the hospital, which is back over towards Sheridan Street, and then it sort of looped around like we saw. McGinnis stayed and turned his attention to Rosenbaum, stated he had heard other shots shortly thereafter. So a couple points on this, right? One is McGinnis is just confirming that uh, Rosenbaum was really trying to be aggressive in taking this gun. He was, he was following him and he was you know, grabbing at literally the barrel of the gun. And then Kyle Rittenhouse actually waited until right as they came together before he pulled the trigger, which is what, uh, what, what, what ended up shooting Rosenbaum a, a number of different times. So again, is that is that Kyle Rittenhouse being the aggressor in this case? From McGinnis's own statements, it does not sound like it. It continues. We're going to move on into the next paragraph. The third video of th that we see that your complaint and reviewed. So the prosecutor is saying, I reviewed the third video. It shows the defendant running northbound on Sheridan Road. So this is the second grouping that we had spoken about, right? We saw the first two videos, which show two angles of the first shots. Then we see one video of the second group of shots. Running northbound on Sheridan Road after he had shot Rosenbaum, the street and the sidewalk are full of people. And that is not an understatement. There's a lot of them. A group of several people begin running northbound on Sheridan Road behind the defendant. A person can be heard yelling what sounds like beat him up. Another person can be heard yelling what sounds like, hey, he shot him. Your complainant reviewed a fourth video that showed a different angle of the defendant running northbound. In this video, a person can be heard yelling, get him, get that dude. Then a male in a light colored top runs towards the defendant and appears to swing at the defendant with his right arm. This swing makes contact, and you can see that right here with the defendant, with Kyle, knocking his hat off. And you can see that, right? There's his hat literally coming off. He's got his gun in his hand here. Here's the, the guy in the white shirt that's swinging at him. The swing makes contact, knocking his head off, hat off. The defendant continues to run northbound. On the video, a male can be heard saying something to the effect of what he do, and another male can be heard responding something to the effect of just shot someone, the male then can be heard yelling, get his ass. The defendant then trips and fall to, falls to the ground. So here we've got a number of different threats. We've got multiple people that we can hear from multiple angles. And if we can hear it, presumably Kyle can hear it. And so he knows that there's a mob of people who are sort of enveloping him and they're chasing him down the street. And we you know, reviewed the video ad nauseum. I don't think we need to do it again, but we've seen he's, he's, he's really getting chased down by a lot of people who are screaming at him. Get him. Get that dude. That's a quote. Get his ass. That's a quote. Beat him up. That's a quote. Those are all on the videos. So we, we want to ask ourselves, you know, if we were in that position or any person was in that position, what would they think? You've got multiple people making those claims against them. What are they supposed to believe? That's going to be important because self-defense is going to be based on what a reasonable person would do sort of in that situation. We're going to get to that statute. We're going to talk about it again briefly. The complainant moves on. He says, or she says, as the defendant is on the ground, let me swap over here. As the defendant is on the ground, an unidentified male wearing a dark colored top and light colored pants jumps over at and over the defendant. So that's this individual right here. So this is part of the complaint that is detailing what happened in count five. Remember in count five, I explained that it was an unknown person. It was this, this person here. We didn't really know who it was, but they're still going to be charging Kyle with a, a crime as a result of uh, firing at this person. He did not hit him, but he fired at him. So they're going to charge him with a crime for that. Now we see here that he jumps over the defendant based on the sounds of the gunshots on the video and the positioning of the defendant's gun. It appears that he fires two shots in quick succession at this person. That person was not hit and he runs away from the defendant. A second person who was later identified as Anthony Huber, who is this uh, individual right here, approaches the defendant who is still on the ground on his back. Huber takes a skateboard in his right hand right here. And when Huber reaches the defendant, 
The defendant makes it appear that he is reaching for the defendant's gun with his left hand as the skateboard makes contact contact with the defendant's left shoulder so here reaching for the gun as the skateboard is coming over his head and hitting kyle huber appears to be trying to pull the gun away from the defendant the defendant rolls on his left side and as huber appears to be trying to grab the gun and the gun is pointed towards huber's body the defendant then takes one round which can be uh, fires one round which can be heard on the video huber staggers away taking several steps then collapses to the ground he subsequently died from the gunshot wound and so we saw that at length right we saw him uh, sort of uh, kyle on the ground getting bombarded by people who were coming through and let's take a look at the language again right we've got the skateboard makes contact with the defendant's left shoulder so does that look like you know, it just makes contact. I love the language that these prosecutors use. Uh, this is, you know, somebody just making contact. It's like, it's like the universe just brought uh, the skateboard and Kyle together to become one. No, this, this guy, Huber, Anthony Huber, was attacking him with his skateboard as he was trying to pull his gun away. That language is way too light, in my opinion. You can see here from the video, from the uh, a clip from the video itself, that he is getting struck over the head. He's got multiple people who we just heard were yelling things like, get his ass, get to him, get that dude, beat him up. And now he's getting hit over the head. He just got kicked in the head and he's just getting hit over the head with somebody else's skateboard who's also trying to take his gun away from him. So this is where we see count three. Count three is going to be the first degree intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon. Once again, that is saying that, yes, Kyle did intend to actually shoot him because he was being attacked. So we see here we're, we're acknowledging that a lot of this stuff had happened, that Kyle did, in fact, shoot people. But the prosecutor's office is, again, making every other person look like the aggressor. Why are they doing that? The complaint goes on. It says that after shooting Huber or Huber, the defendant moves to a seated position. So this is sort of a different angle here. You can see that this is Kyle Rittenhouse on the ground. This is Aaron Huber, who then is now falling to the ground. So it was this guy who hit him with the skateboard. He gets shot uh, right literally in the heart, and then he collapses to the ground and he dies. This other individual, Gage Grosskrutz, is actually charging him as well. He's got a handgun in his possession, and he gets shot in the shoulder. So what does the complaint say? Let me get rid of myself. After shooting Huber, the defendant moves to a seated position and points his gun at a third male, later identified as Gage, as Gage Grosskrutz, who had begun to approach the defendant when the defendant shot Huber. Grosskrutz freezes and ducks and takes a step back. He puts his hands in the air, so he, he's sort of withdrawing for a bit, but then he moves towards the defendant who aims his gun back at Krutz and shoots him firing one shot. He's shot in the right arm. He appears to be holding a handgun in his right hand when he was shot. He then runs southbound from the defendant screaming for a medic and the defendant gets up and start, starts walking northbound. Defendant then turns around facing southbound while walking backwards northbound with his firearm in the ready position pointed pointed towards the people in the roadway and you can see kyle right there this other guy so this is gage grosskritz he gets shot right here and then he starts he does an about face he starts fleeing off he's screaming medic 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 and this other guy realizes that guy just got shot this guy just got shot he stops literally right in his tracks i was going to say dead in his tracks but that's not appropriate we'll say immediately in his tracks he stops and he puts his hands up and then kyle stands up and walks away the remainder of the complaint is uh, you know, some detail stuff we can see that it goes on it says dr kelly of the milwaukee medical examiner's office conducted an autopsy on joseph rosenbaum who was the first person shot here in this scene indicating that he had a gunshot wound to the right groin fractured his pelvis, gunshot wound to the back, which perforated his right lung and liver, gunshot wound to the left hand, a superficial gunshot wound to his lateral left thigh, and a grazed gunshot wound to the right side of his forehead, which we actually did see on camera. And if you remember watching that, well, we saw him with the bullet wound grazed his head, but we didn't realize at that time that he had actually been total, in total been shot five times. Dr. Kelly also conducted an autopsy on Anthony Huber, who is this gentleman down here, indicating that Huber had a gunshot wound to his chest that perforated his heart, aorta, and pulmonary artery in his right lung. So literally right in the chest, and you know that's, that's why he collapsed uh, almost immediately. 
Complaint goes on, wraps up with saying that detective spoke with Dominic Black, who was the person on the receiving end of the phone call. So when Kyle you know, happened here, he picks up the phone, he calls somebody. That was Dominic Black. He's really the only other witness here, but he didn't see anything. He just accepted a phone call. So I'm not even really counting him. He stated that he received a phone call from his friend Kyle at 1146. Defendant stated he shot someone. Detective Abraham uh, Antamarian saw the defendant in person and identified him. So again, they, they needed to, you know, to properly identify him based on the various videos that we saw. The, the final uh, two paragraphs of the complaint, the attorney with the, this office, the Kenosha County District Attorney's Office, bases her knowledge of all of this information on. So remember when I was explaining that this was just the probable cause statement, there's going to be a lot more information that comes out. It's called discovery. So anytime there's a criminal case, and it's, there's going to be a lot of stuff, right? You're going to have an autopsy report, police report, and all that. That's really what this is talking about. So this is what the, the prosecutor reviewed before filing this probable cause statement. It says, statements given to your complainant by all of these different officers and detectives. So there's going to be you know, additional actual police reports that each one of these individuals type up. You know, They'll type up a full report of everything they did, everything they saw, and that's all going to be part of the record or it'll be part of the, uh, the government's case. The statements from Dr. Kelly about the uh, Milwaukee Medical Examiner's Office. So, of course, that's going to be the autopsy reports. We're going to have the videos that were included. We're going to have statements by the citizens. So, uh, citizen informants, we've got Richard McGinnis, who already gave his statement. We sort of went through that uh, kind of at length here. And we've got Dominic Black. So, we're going to have their written statements. Most of the time, these witnesses will actually write a statement out, and that'll be part of the government's files. And then what was interesting is that Kyle, Kyle Rittenhouse, actually spoke to the investigators, spoke to the detectives. So he made statements which were made contrary to his, his, uh, his interests, which, uh, you know, you always hear this all the time, right? Never talk to the cops. Don't talk to the cops because everything you say can and will be used against you. So I'm very curious what his statements are going to be. His statement should also be recorded. If it was a recorded interview, if he wrote a written statement, those are all going to be part of the record. That Those are all going to be you know, admissions. Those are going to be things that he's saying, yeah, I did it. Yeah, I shot him. That was something that I did. And then it's going to be up to the defense to use self-defense as an affirmative defense. And so I want to wrap up with that. The final part of the complaint is signed by the uh, uh, two people here. We've got Angelina Gabriel, who's a deputy district attorney. And then we have a uh, Carly McNeil, who is probably another, you know, district attorney. She's the actual formal complainant, nothing particularly interesting there, but that is the end of the complaint. And so what, we spent a lot of time in the previous video in, in talking about this, discussing what is self-defense, you know, how does provocation supersede self-defense or eliminate self-defense. And I did a little bit more. I, I wanted to reread the self-defense statute because I thought yeah, this is such a clear case of self-defense. Why are they charging him? And here's what we, what we found. It's actually very, very, uh, I think, supportive of the entire self-defense claim. So let's take a look here. We can see that 939.48, a person is privileged to threaten or intentionally use force against another for the purpose of preventing or terminating what the person reasonably believes to be an unlawful interference with his or her person by such other person. So this is important, right? What is reasonable to believe about the situation? The actor may use only such force or threat thereof as the actor reasonably believes which is necessary to prevent or terminate the interference. The actor may not intentionally use force, which is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm, unless the actor once again reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent the imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or herself. So what does that mean, right? They say reasonably three times in that one paragraph. So when you read further, what we want to do is we want to look to Wisconsin law, their case law. We want to say, okay, well, how are the courts interpreting reasonableness, right? What I think is reasonable is probably very different than what my mother thinks is reasonable, right? How I drive on the road is probably a little different than her. So what is reasonable? What's not reasonable? How does the law define it? You know, what are these things? It's all about how these statutes are constructed and how we interpret them in the courts. Because if the court interprets, you know, reasonable belief one way and those instructions are given to a jury, they have to follow the court's instructions. They have to say, okay, well, we're, we're told that reasonableness, it works this way. And so if we apply the facts, 
facts to this methodology of determining what is reasonable and what's not, we're going to come out with this outcome. So it's kind of determining, you know, what, what equation are we using to, to make our analysis? And when you go through the statutes and you look in you know, a little bit further and read some of the notes and some of the case law, here are two things we're able to tease out. We've got these two different uh, portions of the, of the case law from Wisconsin that help us define what reasonable is. Whether a defendant's belief was reasonable under subsection 1 depends in part upon the party's personal characteristics and histories and whether the events were continuous. Remember when I was doing the previous videos, if you had not watched them, I would encourage you to do that. We were talking about whether this was one continuous incident or not. And in my mind, it is, you know, it's one continuous incident. If they're trying to break it up, I don't think that that's going to be successful because it sounds like it was really, really short in time. And that supports this claim of self-defense, right? Somebody else shot first during the original collection of shots. Uh, Rittenhouse was defending himself against Rosenbaum and those shots took place there that self-defense is going to carry over throughout throughout the entirety of the remaining you know the remainder of the ordeal and that's what this is saying it's also saying that you know we can consider some of his personal characteristics and the histories of these other people and in this case you know it does sound like like Kyle was somebody who knew his way around a firearm uh, his you know McGinnis might might think to the contrary, but you know he had a, a sling on. The gun was tried. People tried to take the gun away from him multiple times. Didn't let that happen. Uh, he, you know, potentially fired a warning shot into the ground before he picked his gun up and shot at Rosenbaum. And you know there were other people firing bullets. You know all around him. He shoots two people who are in the second grouping of shots. And then when somebody puts their hands up, he he he, he withdraws from them. Right. One of his shots was was very good. It hit Aaron Huber directly in the chest. I mean, it was a direct kill shot. So he knew you know how to do that. He hit Rosenbaum five times. There were sh seven shots that were fired. Rosenbaum got hit five times of that. So it sounds to me like he knew how to use a gun. And it sounds like, you know, n nothing. None of that was reckless. There was a lot of recklessness charges and all of that. And it doesn't sound like he was intentionally trying to go out there and be reckless with a firearm. There are multiple incidents that we've already talked about here tonight where the prosecutor's office, this, this is not my statements, where they're saying that the other people were the aggressors. The other people were hitting him in the head with a skateboard. The other people were doing a jump kick through the air and hitting him in the head, you know, kicking him in the head. Rosenbaum was trying to pull his gun away. There were other people who were running at him with a gun. There were other people who were saying, get him, beat his ass, get him, you know? And that is something that if we look at his personal characteristics, if we look at his histories and everything here, I think it makes sense that he knew what he was doing and we can consider that you know, basically he he was using a firearm in a reasonable manner that goes on to the next point that we want to address which is here which says that the reasonableness of a person's belief under subsection one is judged from the position of a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence in the same situation as the defendant not a person identical to the defendant placed in the same situation as the defendant so what this is saying is what we're, we're, we're going to try to enforce an objective standard so if we took just a regular ordinary everyday person of standard the, the language of this case is ordinary intelligence and prudence and they were in kyle's situation how would they respond would a reasonable person also feel like they were under threat would a reasonable person also believe that they are trying to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or herself based on the facts based what we know about Kyle based on the situation that he was in by the own prosecutor's office they they the, the entire probable cause statement that we just went through I didn't see anything that indicates that Kyle Rittenhouse was the aggressor in this case not at all people may have a lot of difficulties understanding why a 17 year old is out in the middle of, of Kenosha Wisconsin at 11:43 in the morning with a, you know with a firearm in a dangerous part of you know in a, in a dangerous environment that's a separate issue whether you think that's prudent or not you know that's up to you the language here says that in this position would a person who of ordinary intelligence and prudence in this position feel in Kyle's position specifically would they feel like they needed to use force in order to, to prevent their imminent death or great bodily harm. And I think at every single count along the way, maybe except the one for McGinnis, the answer is, is yes. Yeah, I mean, anybody in that position would have been scared to death. They've got, you know, multiple people with, with diff different weapons, 
shouting, you know, things to get him and, and, and get that boy and firing weapons into the air without a question in my mind, any, any person in that position would feel like this was, was necessary. So then why is the prosecutor's office even submitting this complaint and prosecuting the case and they are prosecuting it you can look the case up right on the court's website and let's see if we can swap over to that and we can see it right here we we can actually see that the the case is being prosecuted and uh district attorney prosecuting attorney is going to be thomas binger it looks like here filed we've got uh, multiple addresses here you know they give you out kyle's home address and that's very, uh, very, very nice of them to do that. I'm sure that's not going to cause any repercussions. We've got, you know, all of the arrest warrants, the complaints being filed and all this stuff. So why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? Why are they charging this, this guy with crimes? And like many things today, the answer, in my opinion, is, of course, politics. It's politics. They have to charge him with a crime because of the outpouring, because of the political people who are in power in Wisconsin. They're saying that they're going to, you know, they have to do this in order to quell the mobs that we're seeing on the streets. It's just something that they need to do. Now, I think that the prosecutors actually wrote this probable cause statement in a way that gives so much evidence and so much good material to Kyle's case that his attorney, who I know he's got an attorney now, I think it was the same attorney who, uh, who represented somebody else, like the name escapes me right now, but another, you know, another big high profile defense attorney is going to be representing Kyle Rittenhouse and they are going to be able to use the prosecutor's own words in their self-defense claims. They're going to be able to pull all of that red language that I underlined today and they're going to be able to say, yeah, look, the prosecutors themselves said that Rosenbaum was trying to take his gun. And he was aggressive and, and, you know, and, and basically chasing him and throwing things at him. A number of other people said that they you know, get him and all those things. Like every single one of those statements, the defense is going to be able to use that in their case. And so to me, it looked like the prosecutors were concerned about the political fallout. And so they needed to file charges quickly because you know, Kenosha, Wisconsin was, was burning down. There were riots and protests and people were uh, you know, very upset about it. And I don't know how that's going to work out for him because when that attorney drives the self-defense truck right through this case and Kyle Rittenhouse is exonerated on these charges or, or, or reduced, you know, these are going to be reduced down significantly. I think he was way overcharged. They're going to plead this down to nothing. And what is the public going to do then? Now, the good news will be that this case will probably drag on for a year, maybe two years, maybe three years before we ever have any final resolution. There will be many more other shootings, police shootings, uh, you know, self-defense shootings, especially if we're not able to, to get some of this stuff under control. And I don't know what the answer is on that. Actually, I've proposed many other solutions in previous videos, but I just, you know, I don't, I'm not real sure that the people who are rioting on the streets, not real sure that they want a solution, unfortunately. And so, if the police are going to keep backing down, the rioters are going to keep burning people's buildings down, there's going to be more of these situations. I hope not, but without the police, what are people supposed to do other than defend themselves? And so that's more on the Kyle Rittenhouse case. We're going to continue to follow along on the story. If you have not already done so, hit the subscribe button, hit the like, and, and do me a favor, share this video. If you like this analysis, if you think that I did a good job in putting this all together, you know, and, and that this provided some value to the conversation, share that for me. I uh, would really appreciate it. It helps the channel grow. It helps keep the conversation going. And it's a lot more fun when I don't have to uh, talk to myself uh, and make these videos with nobody, uh, you know, nobody commenting or watching on them. So I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you, you know, leaving a comment, hitting the subscribe button, uh, button and liking us. If you haven't already, take a look at my new book. I just released it a few months ago. It's available on Amazon. It's called Beginning to Winning, How to Fight Your Case and Succeed in the Criminal Justice System. You can check that out on Amazon. There'll be links in the description. You also, if you want, and you should join us on our live show on Wednesdays. On Wednesdays, we do Watching the Watchers Live. That's where I monitor and hold accountable anybody involved in the criminal justice system, police, prosecutors, judges, politicians, anybody who's sort of infringing on our constitutional rights, things like the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, search, seizure, the right to counsel, uh, the Second Amendment. These are super important principles that I feel like are kind of being encroached upon from time to time. Watching the watchers is what we do to hold them accountable so that we can make sure those interests are protected. So we'll see you here next week on Wednesday, 4 p.m. Arizona time, which is specific time right now. Look forward to having you be a part of that live show and join us in the comments. Until then, 
We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.